This morning we complete our series, Tales of the Sea. If you've been in worship during this series, you know that we have been looking at stories that took place around and on the Sea of Galilee in Jesus' ministry. The Sea of Galilee, or Galilee itself, was the focal point for Jesus' ministry. The home base was really the town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, and so much took place uh, around the sea and on the sea. And we complete that this morning with one of the stories that is in a group of stories found in the Gospels, always, of course, at the end of the Gospels, called Resurrection Appearance Narratives. These are the experiences that people have of the resurrected Christ following the death and resurrection of Jesus. Those experiences that were so transformative in the life of the disciples that they were turned ultimately from being fearful and hunkered down either behind locked doors or hiding elsewhere or off by themselves mourning, uh, transformed into courageous witness in the streets and in the villages, transformed from fear to confidence and trust through these experiences. And this is one of those experiences on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> one of the things I've been thinking about this week as I've thought about the experience of the disciples, and particularly as it relates to memories, are the people who have been suffering from the effects of the storm and those who have been rescuing and doing the work of recovery. This story that has echoed down through the ages and has been so important not only in the early church but in the life of the church and in the lives of people in every time and place, the importance of that story is what it says about new beginnings, a chance to start over, about the healing of memories. And so I've had these folks on my mind because Memories are burned into our minds through the emotional impact that they have. It may be good memories, like a surprise birthday party, the birth of a child, a wedding day, meeting a new friend, or they can be very painful memories. And it's that second category in particular I have on my mind because I think about these people who have experienced the flooding of their homes have the experience of rising water and the helplessness in the face of it and how those memories will be there for a long, long, long time. And there will be things undoubtedly in the future that will trigger those memories, that all those emotions and the experience and the details, every detail of what they experienced and felt will come flooding back when the water begins to flood in a street. Maybe it's just a regular storm, but the storm drain fills up and suddenly those memories begin to come back. You may have heard, I'm sure you've heard, the interviews with people who were in Katrina and suffered that disaster and they moved to Houston and started their lives over and then were hit again. And over and over again they described as the rain fell and as the water rose, it brought back all of those memories that they had experienced all those years ago when they suffered the effects of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Memories are encoded and burned in our brains by the emotional impact that they have. Now I have that on my mind because the disciples, when they're out on the Sea of Galilee in our text for today in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, the disciples are carrying with them a lot of memories. And there are triggers going on in this text for those memories that they carry. It's just as the light begins to shine a bit in the east, not sunrise yet, but it's just getting light in the east. They've been fishing all night and they haven't caught anything. And so the sight of the sky just beginning to get light, the experience of being out on the lake, that empty feeling of the empty nets, 
and having fished all night and caught nothing. All of those are triggers for some memories. And so we go back to the very first story in this series. When they're out and they've fished all night and they haven't caught anything, and they get back in and they're washing their nets, and Jesus is walking by the lake, and, and he says, go back out and cast your nets on, in the deep water, and you will have a big catch. And they did. And sure enough, the nets were so full, they were starting to break. And, and they couldn't pull them into the boat. They had to get help from another boat to bring the catch in. It was the catch of a lifetime. And surely, as they made their way in that, that early that morning, they would have that memory in their minds. And that memory would flood in how they had gotten back on the shore and even with that catch of a lifetime when Jesus said come and follow me and I will make you fish for people they left it all the nets the boats the catch the business all of it and they followed him and now some three years later what has come of it all follow me and I will make you fish for people Jesus had said, but Jesus has died on the cross. Jesus is not with them anymore as he had been. They don't quite know what to do. In fact, the text says, as they are sitting around not really knowing what to do, they retreat to what is familiar to them. Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And they say, we'll go with you. And they go back out and they do what they know to do. Sometimes when we don't know what to do, retreating into the familiar is what we, what we do. We need the familiarity. We need to have a sense that we know what we're doing and, and, and we have some control over what's going on. But all those memories come flooding back, including the memory of that call on their lives. It's triggered because of the sights and the sounds and the experience that they have. It was especially difficult for Simon Peter. <clears throat> Simon Peter had all sorts of memories flooding back in his mind, uh, very painful ones. It's true that all the disciples had scattered when Jesus was arrested. But it was Simon Peter who said, when Jesus predicted they would do so, Lord, they may desert you, but I would never desert you. And Jesus had said to him, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And as they make their way into shore, he hears the roosters at daybreak beginning to crow all over the place. A trigger for all of this flood of memories that comes back to him, how he had stood warming himself by a charcoal fire in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, how he had done exactly what Jesus said he would do. He had denied him three times, the third time, even with a curse. As he looked over and he saw Jesus led through the courtyard in chains, and that brief moment when their eyes met, and the pain of it, all of that flooding back when he hears the roosters crow. The details of it, the smell of the charcoal fire, the feel of its warmth, the way the light played on the faces of the people gathered around and on the face of Jesus when their eyes met briefly, the pain of hearing again in his mind his own words as he denied even knowing Jesus, and then once again, the experience of his own weeping. All of that came flooding back. Painful memories. Triggered by what he was experiencing that morning. They looked on the shore and they saw a stranger there. And when he called out for them to cast their nets on the right side, one of them said, it's the Lord. And Simon Peter didn't even wait for them to get into shore. He jumped in and he made his way in the hundred yards to the shore. And when they arrived with their very large catch, 153 fish, just so you know, 
you know, you, you know it's a, a tall tale when they say, there were hundreds of fish, but if they counted them, 153, that lends a little credence to the fisherman's tale. And so they go into the shore, and there they find more triggers for the memories, a charcoal fire. Now, in, our, in the Common English Bible, the translation's not very good. This is one of those places where I think they miss the mark. Because there are two times when there is a particular Greek word used in all of the New Testament that means charcoal fire. It's a specific kind of fire. It's used when it speaks of the fire in Caiaphas' courtyard, and it's used here. This specific kind of fire, this trigger for a memory. The, the roosters are crowing everywhere. There's a charcoal fire. The light's dancing in the face of the risen Christ who is there. He has cooked breakfast, a meal, which means always in the Bible reconciliation and a new beginning and a new relationship and a start. All of this is set up in a way that brings the disciples, and particularly Simon Peter, face to face with those memories. It's not done out of cruelty, of course. Nor is it done to rub it in their faces that they have forgotten their call that happened on the shore. Or Simon, that he had denied Jesus three times. But rather, it seems as though everything is set up in just the way to trigger those memories so that they face them, so that they can be healed and restored and have a new beginning. Down through the ages, this, this scripture has spoken to people in just that way, and it speaks to people today. It speaks to us in this place of worship because we have memories that we need, that need healing. We have regrets that need to be, to be healed so that we can move forward. We have guilt and perhaps that has morphed into shame that we need to, by God's grace, be able to leave behind and move forward in our lives. It is the age-old story, generation after generation, this resurrection appearance of Jesus speaks to us. The risen Christ is with us, we say, in our affirmation of faith. And one of the things that the risen Christ does is provide forgiveness and healing and new beginnings. Years ago, in fact, 14 years ago this summer, I was at Oxford <clears throat> for 10 days doing some independent study. And I dropped in a Methodist church in Oxford one Sunday morning, not knowing who I would be listening to in the, in the sermon or what kind of experience I would have, they had a guest preacher that day, and he had a ministry called The Healing of Memories. And I'll never forget that worship service and that experience. Because he walked out and he stood in front of us with a patch over one eye, a badly scarred face, a prosthetic arm, a prosthetic leg. He had been the victim of a letter bomb in South Africa during the fight against apartheid. He had been an organizer trying to organize against apartheid, trying to organize for change in his country, and he had received a letter bomb that nearly took his life and disfigured him. He stood before us and he talked about the healing of memories. He stood before us and he talked about forgiveness. He stood before us and he talked about how it's possible by God's grace to begin anew. Possible even for a nation to begin anew. Possible, he said, because first of all, you have to really face those memories and then you can deal with them and you have to deal with them through counseling and through being part of a community of faith and through embracing that reality that the risen Christ is with us, that God is at work in our lives. And that's what makes it possible to move on. He said that we have a tendency when there is a bad memory to want to forget it, to want 
to completely put it out of our minds, but until we adequately deal with it, he said, it just keeps coming back. He said it's like a family album, and there's a painful memory, and so you go through and you cut out all the pictures of that event or that person, trying to put it aside, but he said that really doesn't work. And I, I think as those disciples got to the shore and there's the charcoal fire and the roosters are crowing and it's sunrise and all those memories of the great catch and the call to follow Jesus and the terrible memory of his denial on the part of Simon Peter, it's all there. And then the risen Christ does something very special. He says to Simon, Simon, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Simon, do you love me? He asks a second time. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it says when he asked the third time, it hurt Simon Peter. It stung that third time. Three times he denied, three times he asked the question and he has the chance to say, yes, Lord, you know everything, you know I love you. It's as though it, that the risen Christ came to Simon Peter in just the way he needed to provide healing. And the memories were changed. You know what I think? I think from that moment on, when the roosters were crowing in the morning, it wasn't this terrible memory of Caiaphas' courtyard. It was this memory of what happened on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in a place that became holy ground. In fact, the traditional spot that the church decided centuries ago was the place where this happened. There is a church called the Primacy of St. Peter. And there's a flat rock that forms the communion table in that church. And that's said to be the place where the charcoal fire was built, where breakfast was cooked and, cooked and where that meal of reconciliation took place. And so when they partake of the Lord's Supper, it's in that holy place. It was holy ground wherever it was for Simon Peter from that moment on. Whenever he saw the place, there was a new memory, the memory of new life and forgiveness and reconciliation. Whenever he warmed himself by a charcoal fire, he truly warmed himself instead of having the icy, awful feelings and memories that he had had before this moment of restoration and new life. The good news for you and for me is that the risen Christ is with us to give us a second chance, a new beginning, a new start. The message down through the ages has been if Simon Peter can start over after his denial of Jesus, then how much more can we by God's grace in Christ? These disciples had retreated to what was familiar. They had gone back to fishing. They didn't know quite what to do. They had forgotten their call to follow Jesus. They assumed that that was over. But the last words that he speaks to them in this story is follow me, follow me. All of this gives them a new memory of a call, a new call to follow Jesus, a reminder the risen Christ is with them that as they go, they will become, as Paul would say, the body of Christ, the feet and the hands and the, and the heart of Christ at work in the world as they seek to follow him. Now, we're inheritors of that, all of us. We stand in that tradition. We come to worship to hear again the words, follow me. We come to worship to hear again the good news that we can always begin anew, the good news that Christ can bring healing and hope to us no matter what. And Christ says, follow me and go and feed my sheep. As you have received this meal of reconciliation, go and feed it to others. That's the good news of our faith that we celebrate today and that we take with us from this place. Thanks be to God. Amen.